we're going to start with the introduction to fireflies. Um, a lot of these pictures are some I have taken in the West Indies, so they are not species that we can have here. Uh, besides the larvae on this picture, that is um, a pyrectomina, which we have species, but this particular one is from Puerto Rico. And I'm gonna just start with some uh, resources besides the ones that uh, Candace has shared with you. I think she has shared with you a folder with uh, literature um, that you later or during this course can use to get more information, uh, how to identify species uh, level uh, for a few genera. And if you are really interested, um, Sarah Lewis published this really amazing guide um, about fireflies and their wondrous world. And it's really informative and, and it's entertainingly written. And you will get any information you want if you're you know, just starting out with fireflies that you would like to learn about fireflies. And there's also a TED talk on YouTube, The Loves and Lies of Fireflies, which I also recommend you watching, where she talks about um, the flash pattern and all that kind of like uh, detail about what's going on when they uh, flash at night. Another one is the field guide for um, the Eastern US. Sadly, it doesn't cover the uh, Western US, but the Eastern US by Lynn uh, Frierson Faust. Um, Fireflies, glowworms, and lightning bugs, uh, 356 pages full of amazing information that um, you would, you know, it's it's a great book if you want to have some help with identifying things uh, to the species or the genus level. She has covered almost every species in the Eastern US. This book, A Naturalist's Long Walk Among Shadows of North American Futurists, it's a very interesting read. It's very interestingly written, more like um, old English prose than actual scientific um, literature. It's free to download at the web address at the bottom on the slide. And it's basically the story of 50 years of field work by uh, Jim Lloyd, who sadly passed away in 2020. Um, but this book is just full of information and it gives you everything you need to know about how to identify for tour species based on their flash patterns. It has the flash pattern for every species um, I think east of the Rocky Mountains in it. And again, we can put that link later in the um, chat so you can um, note it down and uh, download the book. And um, lastly, this is a website by Radim Schreiber of www.fireflyexperience.org. Uh, he is an amazing photographer and videographer that helped many documentaries and also the Circe Society and me, who he like very graciously let us use some of his pictures for these presentations and uh, the Circe Society uh, um, Firefly Atlas. And just check it out and look at his uh, things. And he's also very approachable and always happy to chat about um, how to uh, fire, uh, photo, photo, do photogra photography of fireflies. So now we're gonna go into fireflies, but first I have my first poll. Um, and I give you about 30 seconds or so, and just let us know what you call fireflies in your area where you come fire from. Fireflies, lightning bugs, glowworms, Okay. Just 10 more seconds and then uh, we're done. All right, so um, I guess it's mostly fireflies and lightning bugs. And I, I'm all, since I started studying fireflies, I've always been really amazed about that they're known for both of them, which both of them are kind of like a misnomer since they're not flies or bugs, they're actually beetles. and. So interesting. And uh, sometimes I'm, I'm wondering if there's some kind of geographic uh, division on who calls it what, but we can't go into that. So I'm gonna end the poll and show the results. So you can see 64% of you call it fireflies. 
And so we're starting with the life cycle of fireflies. So fireflies are holometabolous or, um, uh, yeah, holometabolous. And so they have all four, they have four life stages. We have the egg stage, the larva stage, the pupil stage and the adult stage. Um, the timeframes on this slide come from Zorita Garcia et al in 2022, who did the life cycle of Photinus extensus. And um, so they can vary a lot um, because some fireflies seem to be in the larval stage more than a year. Um, so uh, don't take these numbers as the as um, it's for every species, it's not so, but it's basically how the life stages are. Um, and as you can see, the fireflies spend most of their time in the larval stage where they also feed uh, mostly on um, earthworms, slugs, and snails. And then a short time in the pupil stage and a short time in adult stage. Some definitely uh, live longer than 10 days, but that's the most of it. And some really cool uh, literature came out in the last few, um, a couple of years or so um, that deals with not the taxonomy or systematics of biology of fireflies, but more how the broad public or how society sees fireflies. And here on the left side by Kate Flint, the beauty of fireflies, transience, myth, bioluminescence, and wonder. Um, really nice paper, really cool paper that talks about uh, fireflies in um, society. And then the same for Fireflies in Art by Dr. Frischmann Volzat, um, who talks about fireflies and the emphasis on Japanese woodblock prints in different periods. Um, if you have um, time or like interest, I really recommend reading both of them. And I think both of them are public uh, open access and can be accessed by the um, URLs at the bottom. So the first stage like we talked about is the egg stage. And interestingly, and I'm not sure if many of you know that, the eggs also glow. And as far as I know, we haven't found any eggs that do not glow unless um, some Futurist eggs might not, uh, might not glow as uh, Jim told me, but I'm not sure about that. I've never seen that. But um, so these probably glow for um, protective reasons. So they um, tell predators that they are not palatable. Um, the larval stage, which you can see here, see here this is um, a lava from uh, Asia. And you can see larvae can also glow and they glow mostly at the uh, last segments of the abdomen. This is the stage where they live the longest. And like I said, uh, they eat earthworms and um, slugs and snails. And then you have the pupil stage. Also, as far as you know, all of them can uh, glow. And also, again, this is an in, uh, immobile stage. So they glow for protection, mostly. And then we all know the adult stage. This is a picture by Terry Priest of uh, Photinus. Uh, but not all firefly, fireflies in the adult stage actually glow. And we have that in the winter firefly, which is uh, now Photinus coruscus, used to be Alignia corusca, um, which as adults do, does not glow. But there has been in the first couple of hours or half a day or so when they close from their pupil stage, sometimes you can still see the remnants of the light organ in a, in a slight glow but um, uh, usually like after that, they will not glow. And with that, that's the end of the introduction. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about firefly morphology. And we're gonna just give you basic terms of the morphology of these uh, insects, just so you can, um, it will help you when we talk about the genera and the species to know the terms that we tell you are um, characters to do identifications uh, to the generic level or the species level. This is um, Lucy Doda Lutacalis from which is an uh, which is from Florida and I think uh, Alabama. Um, this is a picture by Brandon Wu and I'm going to use that uh, to show you the basic body parts of an insect or of a beetle. So we have the head, 
uh, at the at the top there with the antennae, then the thorax, and then we have the abdomen. Um, and I'm aware the abdomen actually in this picture shows the elytra. The abdomen is underneath, you can't really see that, and I will point that out later again. And the elytra or the wings or the wing covers are the front wings of beetles. They are um, hardened to protect, and they are actually derived from the thorax and not from the abdomen. So they are attached to the thorax and not really to the abdomen, but they cover the abdomen. Then uh, each insect, they have three legs, and we're going to talk about four or pro legs, the middle or meso leg, and then the hind or the met meta leg. So those are terms that you should keep in mind. Then each uh, firefly has two antennae uh, that they use um, sometimes for chemical communication. They can smell with them. When they usually when they have very like elaborate antennae, they use that for chemical um, communication. And then they usually don't um, have light organs, and that's how they find their mating partners. Uh, this is the pronotum, or as we call it, and on the head shield. Uh, in some of the documents from the Circe Society, uh, this can be a good character sometimes to identify. Um, sometimes it has beta, like little markings on them, sometimes not, like in this one. This is the scutellum, which also derives from the thorax. Uh, and it says this little, um, little triangle or shield-shaped um, character that uh, is in at the beginning of the, uh, before in front of the elytra in between them. Uh, the shape of that is sometimes uh, a good character to identify fireflies. And then here, these that's the arrow points at one half of the elytra, which is called an elytron or the wing case. This is the hardened forewing, which protects uh, the hind wings, which are membranous, uh, which you can see here. Um, Again, here the elytrons or the elytra, and each side is an elytron or wing case again. And then here, those are the membranous wings that they actually use to fly. So they do not use the wings, uh, the the, uh, the elytra to fly. They're just being, when they fly, they're just being held uh, up. And then they use the membranous hind wings to fly. And again, here, if you uh, want to test yourself, what is that? What was that character called? Um, and it's in this case again the one antenna, one antenna or the antennae. And the shape of the antennae is a very good character, especially in North American fireflies, to put them into groups. We don't, we, there's certain ones that only you have one genus that has them. There's others that several genus genera have, but it's a very good way to group them and to wiggle them down for your identification. So you know you can exclude some of these 22 or so genera that we have, and you don't have to look at them because they have either here, you can see on the, on the left side of your screen, the filiform antennae or string-like. They're like, just like these little strings. Um, and usually most fireflies have 11 antennomeres or segments like this one, you have, 11, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. That's the standard usually, but then there's some that have more and some that have less. Um, a few of our fireflies have serrate or sawtooth antennae. That's the second one from the left. Um, the saw kind of like, like that sawtooth structure can be bigger or smaller. So um, that's also sometimes a good character if you have very big sawtooth antennae, that's probably Lucy Dota Atra. Uh, smaller ones, probably something in uh, Pyropigera. It's another genus. Then we have flabellate or fan-shaped antennae um, that they have. Instead of that, they kind of like have these um, rami, this little these little parts here that are called rami that go off, and they can be bigger or smaller. Uh, like you can see in the middle or the one to the right, um, the rami can be very short or very very long. And then we have. Uh, biflabellate antennae, where each segment of the antennae has two of these rami going off. Um, and that's um, one that, in at least in the US and Canada, there's only one genus that has that. So if you see this kind of antennae, you know 
you have, oh, there's actually two, but this uh, like exactly like this uh, in black, that's um, the genus polyclasses. And then some fireflies can actually have a lot more segments than uh, 11. And that's like the genus Amididis, which is South American. And they can have up to 45 uh, of these uh, of segments with these long Rami, um, which is a very amazing genus. And it's too bad we don't have that in North America. And then here, this is a female Photinus uh, firefly that um, you can see she uh, does not have full elytra, the, the wing covers here, they are shortened. So that also means, and you can't see any membranous wings, right? You can see those. So this one cannot fly, it's only uh, crawling on the, on the um, ground or on like leaves or blades of uh, grass and stuff like that. Um, and here you have the antennae again, one antenna here, and these are the elytra or the, one elytron. And like you can see, it's um, shortened. Not all female fireflies are like this. Some have full wings and can fly, but a, a lot of our fireflies also look like this, the females. Uh, then this, um, this is actually a pyrectomina species. And here it's just on the pronotum or the head shield, you have sometimes markings in different colors, black, often black, yellow, or red. And these are also called beta or vitae. And so we sometimes can use those to, um, for identification of species. And um, Jim Lloyd in his book about Futurus has a chapter where he goes into this in very much details and explains how the different parts of these markings are called. There's also a lytral or wing cover markings like this one. This stripe is actually very interesting. Usually the stripe is only on the uh, wings, uh, hind, uh, the front wings of um, Futuris, but this Pyrectomina also has them, which is um, can be uh, kind of confusing when you just take a quick look at it. You might think this is a Futuris, but um, there's other characters that will then tell you it's not. But a lot of these, the, this, v, this stripe on the um, elytron is um, a good character for Futuris, a lot of the species. And then here, we're also going to talk about the elytra margarine. If it's um, in a different color than the elytra, like you here, you can see the elytron mostly is black, but the elytra margarine here on the outside um, is yellow. Um, and sometimes we're going to talk about that. And we're going to use that for identification um, purposes. And this is the ventral or the lower uh, downside of a firefly. Here again, the antennae, the eyes, um, big eyes usually indicates that the firefly has uses light organs or flashing for communication. So they have big eyes so they can uh, see the light better. If you have smaller eyes, it usually in most cases means they do not have light organs. They do not use um, flashing for your communication. So your uh, day active fireflies like um, Pyropigia or Elichnia, uh, Photinus now, but the previous Elichnia. Then here, uh, sometimes we talk about the coxa, which is this segment at the that, that's connected to um, the thorax. This is still the thorax. All the legs are connected, uh, attached to the thorax. And then we have the femur. We talk about the femur. This is this first segment, which is like in, you know, your in humans, the femur, then the hind tibia, which is this segment right after the femur, and then the hind leg tarsi. Um, there's usually five in fireflies. Um, at least I don't think I can think of a different one right now, um, but sometimes there will, um, a key or literature will tell you to look at them and how they're shaped. And if they have uh, tarsal pads, like these little, um, uh, like here at the end, these are tarsal pads, and sometimes that's important as well. And then here, we will often talk about abdominal, abdominal segments, um, two through five, which are visible. Um, and so this one here, this little part here is abdominal ventral two, and this one here that ends here is abdominal segment five, or we also call them ventrite, 
one through four, which ventrite means they're actually visible. And there's one hidden right here underneath the thorax. There's a segment, the number one is hidden under here that you can't see that in this uh, perspective. Sometimes when you hold them right under the microscope, you'll be able to see them. Uh, but those are the most important ones. And then this is the light organ. This, is, this would be segment six and seven which is usually the, uh, the, land, the lanterns or the light organs are on these segments. They're not always as big as in this um, example. And these are, so segments six and seven or ventrites five and six. So when you read a key or you read a paper and they talk about either the segments or the ventrites, uh, just make sure that you adjust your counting. And then here's segment eight, this little, these little ones. And then segment nine, which is, um, a segment that's evolved for the, uh, to protect the genitalia, and that's where the genitalia actually, uh, if you will dissect them, come out here. And then here underneath and on the dorsal side also is the pygidium, uh, which sometimes the shape of the pygidium is used for identification in certain, usually for species, on species level. And then, um, we switch to the larval stage, which um, also can be identified. Um, sadly, we do not have a lot of larval stages or la larval fireflies identified or described and actually connected with the adults. So there is a lot of work we have to do. And then there is this really good paper that came out in 2021, which is a comprehensive review and call for studies on firefly larvae. Um, we usually concentrate on the adults instead of the immatures, but this is you know, arguably maybe the most interesting of the life stages because it's the longest. And this is like maybe the inter most interesting natural history where you know, they eat and they grow. And so you know, fi finding out what they eat, are they specific to one or two snails or earthworm, or are they generalists and they will eat any snail that they come along? Or how do they live? You know, we have some um, number uh, up here, D, I think is a, a here D, that's um, aquatic larvae. So some fireflies live in aquatic habitats during the larval stage, um, mo mostly in Asia. And some others, do, uh, most, mostly they do not. And you can here see um, different shapes of firefly larvae, which here the first one and the last one, A and F, are probably the most encountered in, and E probably, are most, the most encountered in North America, which A looks like the genus Paractomina, E looks like the genus Photurus, and F is kind of like a typical Photinus. So when you go out collecting or so in the future, please don't just look for adults, also look for the larvae and um, try not to trample on them when you do your uh, surveys because you know they are down in the leaf litter and hiding and stuff during the day and at night they crawl around looking for food, but they also glow. So if you are out in the dark and you see glowing from the ground, go and investigate and you know catch some of these things. And then we can use barcoding, which we talk later about to match these guys up, the larvae with the adults, and then we can describe the larvae and expand our knowledge. Because I think for North America, currently there's only five larval descriptions. Um, that's about 150 or so for the world. So less than 10% of all the firefly species known have a larval description. And it would be wonderful if we could change that. And here, uh, other, um, graphic or image from the paper. And these are like characters of the larvae that are important for identification. So you have here the mouth parts, the mandibles, which have this, this you can see this little dotted line. This is where the, they kind of like bite into the snail and they inject this chemical to liquefy their prey. And then they suck it up through the mandible. This uh, HD is the head. Um, which is also very uh, in, uh, important, which these are parts that we describe in papers. Um, TB, the tubercles, uh, the and the 
th this is an important character, which you will see. There are some that have these complete plates, some have divided plates like micro, Micronaspis, Floridana. Uh, spiracles are important. And then PG, the pygopodium, which are these little tiny structures which the firefly uses to move along. So it will walk on its leg, but it will then retract its abdomen towards itself and then kind of like move them down and then push itself forward. So they're also very important. And then here on the bottom in black, you can see some kind of, some of the lava, light, light organization on these larvae where they sometimes only have two on the underside. You can see also on the upper side, sometimes here four or more, even like this one has 12. So these are all very important things to identify them to genus. We don't have probably the time to talk a lot about the larvae and identification. Um, we can maybe talk a little bit about the general look of some of these and how you can field identify them. But in the end, like I said, please, if you see them, collect them, get in touch with a scientist. Um, and we have several here in the US, uh, Sarah Lewis, Lynn Foss, uh, Mark Brenham, uh, Katrine Stenger Hall, and myself, and we will work with you. And maybe you can be part of a scientific publication uh, describing this lava and advancing our knowledge of fireflies overall. And like I said, this is maybe the most interesting of the life stages. Um, this is a poster that when I was at the University of Florida, one of my undergrad researchers, Evan Waite, um, and a bunch of other um, scientists, uh, colleagues worked on this. We did this poster, but sadly this uh, description has not been officially published. But here you can see, this is how Elicnia or now Futura, uh, Futinus coruscus looks. This is a dorsal picture. This is a ventral and this is um, the underside. And this, oh, sorry, this is the head from uh, dorsal and ventral. And then here you have drawings about of the antennae of the lava, the mandible and the left maxilla. And these are very important um, characters we can use to not only differentiate between the different genera, or, but also uh, between the species um, of fireflies that you encounter. <clears throat> and there's a little description, and um, Evan presented this at the meeting of the Entomological Society of uh, America. And we are still trying to actually uh, get this published and yeah, get this information out. And um, Evan actually used DNA barcoding. We took the barcode of the larvae and the adult, what we thought it was, and we sequenced them and it then had a 99.9% .9 match. And so we know that this lava is the one that of the adult of Futinus uh, Coruscant. For servers, I'm just gonna give you a little bit about um, a lot of you guys, maybe not everyone, might put, want to participate in the Circe Society Firefly Atlas. Um, sorry, surveys. And what I want to say is the most important thing when you do surveys is your safety. Do not do anything that is dangerous to yourself or others or also um, are the, the animals that are surrounding you. So please always be aware of what's going on around you. And these are nighttime surveys. You may or may not have your light on. So please check out the habitat during the day so you know a little bit about it, so you know where you are. Be aware there's other wildlife around you. There might be uh, venomous snakes. There might be um, you know, other animals, depending where you are, there might also be just little um, obstacles, you know, that little, the big stone that you didn't see and you might fall over. You might have to be close to water, you might fall in the water. So you know, please uh, take a check on this list. It's also on the Firefly Atlas website. 
and make sure you're safe. High visib visibility, a reflective vest, because you know you might have hunters in the area. Long sleeves and close toed shoes. Um, there's, where there's fireflies, there's mosquitoes. And then if something feels not right or you feel unsafe, please leave the area, make sure that everything is all right. And when you walk around, stay on the, a lot of times stay on the path, do not go off the path. You know, you might um, step on firefly lobby that are um, also around and then the leaf litter. So you wanna be on the path if at all possible. If you need to go into the areas, be careful, maybe watch on the ground what you, if you see any glowing. Um, there's also other animals and um, other larvae, so please always be careful about that. Um, the, I see in the Q&A, someone says about um, red headlamps. Yes, they are, if you have to have the red lamp, uh, headlamp on, use a uh, red light. Um, it's not completely um, okay for the fireflies, but it's the best we have. Um, there's some great studies out by Avalon Owens. Um, on Asian species where she figured out a wavelength that works well for not disturbing them, but that's mostly for Asian fireflies. So a little more research is uh, needed for us here. Maybe we can find something similar. Um, and I saw there's a, there's a comment about when do we see larvae? Um, well, mainly the few weeks before you would see the adults. Um, they will be out. They can be anywhere from the leaf litter or on trees, like um, some of the pyrectomina lava. They will be on trees. Uh, I think um, for Tinus coruscus also. Um, the best way I find them usually is to go out and I turn my light off and then my, let my eyes adjust. And then I just look at the ground and see if I can see some um, flash, uh, some glowing. Um, I mainly did that in Hispaniola and on the sides of waterways is a good chance that you will see some of them because they're usually also in moist habitats. So on the side of a river, inside of a um, lake or so or pond where there is also snails. If you see um, snails around, look for firefly larvae, they might be out hunting. Um, not finding them is a reason why we don't have a lot of the descriptions. So um, yes, that's, uh, they're not always easy to find. And then, okay. Um, some equipment we wanna get over, go over fast for firefly uh, collecting and data collecting. We are in a great time, you know, the last few years where we have all a mobile phone that have amazing cameras now. Um, or your, you know, standard camera, whatever you have, but your mobile phone have, they have great cameras and they're usually sufficient to take a picture for identifications. Um, if you are participating in the Firefly Atlas, have your data sheets with you. Survey protoc protocol instructions, which are also on the websites, please uh, read through those or have them with you. Make sure that you have a flashlight or a headlamp with a red bulb if possible, or you can just take um, like reddish paper and put it over to um, like discolor the white light. Um, so you wanna just try to avoid disrupting fireflies and their flash um, communication. And if you can at all, if you know your surroundings, Try to be out, out without the light, have it with you in case of emergency, but try to be outside without light. Uh, light. And you know, after like 10 minutes in the dark, your eyes will adjust and you will see a lot more than you think. And it makes it easier to see some of these fireflies that may not have the brightest flash and just the dim flash. And so if you can, please try not to have a light, but please be safe. Um, reflective safety vest. A voice recorder to take notes. Uh, you can use your smartphones. I try not to use my smartphone for that because of 
the screen goes on, you have light, a light source that you might not want. So a voice recorder is actually a better choice unless you can turn your voice recorder on and the screen off. An insect net, like on the bottom right here. So if you are observing a flash pattern, you might wanna catch exactly that firefly. So you can associate the adult that did the flashing with <coughs> the flash pattern that you recorded. So you can go outside with the net and catch that one. But please be aware of the regulations of the area you are in. Are you allowed capturing um, this, these fireflies? Are you allowed to capture and release maybe, or are you allowed to capture and take for further studies? So please be aware of that. Uh, make sure that you know that for any state park, uh, national park, national um, forest or so that you know the regulation. Ishwari posted in the uh, Q&A also to put snake gators on, depending where you are, that's a very good idea. You never know what's um, out there with you, especially snakes. So you wanna be protecting yourself from that in, in the dark. Have a clipboard with you, with your data sheets and whatever other information, maybe your permits or so that you uh, have for a given area to allow, to allow collection. If someone stops you, please have the permits with you so you can show that. And then this is um, very important. Um, and if you wanna read more about this, uh, Jim's book, Jim Lloyd's books again, a thermometer for measuring air temperature because <laughs> the warmer it gets, the flash pattern slightly changes, the warmer it gets, the flash pattern gets faster. So you might uh, wanna have that so you know that whatever you are collecting is the right species based on the temperature and the flash pattern, and you're not mistaking something because it all of a sudden flashes a lot faster than it did at 70, de 70 degrees than it did at 90 degrees. So um, thermometer is always important. Um, Diana asked in the Q&A if there's a trick we can attract. Um, do you mean um, larvae or adults? Um, larvae, I'm not 100% sure. I mean, you can always try to have snacks or snails in like a little cage that's big enough. The openings are big enough to let firefly larvae in. The adults, some come to uh, black lights and some, if you are really good and you understand Jim's book very well and you know your flash pattern, you can actually, and Jim did this a thousand times the first time I went out with him in the field, he took a laser pointer or laser pen and he watched the fireflies and he recognized what species it was. And then he used the, flat, the pen to simulate the flash pattern and he would have the adult males come in and land on him. Uh, this was a neat party trick, which I also think he did at universities. He would give lectures in big lecture halls that would turn the light off, release fireflies, and he would call them in through the lecture hall and they would land on him. So it's a neat party trick if you can learn that for different species. And yes, you can call them in with that kind of like technique. Um, but otherwise, yes, black light, some species will come to that. Or you might, if you have a female, and you might be able to also lure them in via chemicals or that the females give off or the light, the glowing pattern. If you have them in a little cage, the males might land on the little cage if they can see the flash pattern and the female, and the female enters. So that might be another way to um, yeah, catch some of the adults. Um, Yes, and Robert said that in national forests, capture and release usually have, needs no permits. A lot of times, uh, even collecting in national forests is allowed. Um, please contact the um, rangers to see what's going on. N uh, state parks, national parks, you definitely need permits for any kind of um, capture, even if it's release or capture for study. Um, Please have permits. The, the same usually is for city parks, city uh, forests, um, anything below the uh, conservation areas, anything like below this national level, 
make sure you contact the authorities before you go. Make sure you know what to fill out, how to get them, uh, how to get permits, um, and then know how many you can catch and uh, you know know how what you have to report back to them because usually they would like to have a report um, about what they want. Um, and this is the same for any mostly any country in the world. If you travel and you want to capture some fireflies, you will need permits and you will need um, paperwork to import them into the US. So you might you will have per, have to have permits and allow it, they need to allow you to export them and then you will also have to report them in fish and light life when you come back to the US. Um, so they know what's going on. And um, it's a very serious offense to go collecting without permits. So please be aware of that. <laughs>